the Sacramento economy. So um, I'm going to be giving you guys an overview of uh, the camera. That's all right. We're on, we're on camera. We got gotcha. you. Yeah, he, he's late. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, we won't tell Father Jerome. I'm sure he'll never see this. Uh, so. <laughs> so anyway, so the Sacramento economy, um, basically I'll give you an introduction to the sacraments this evening. Um, we will answer any questions that you have uh, to the best of my ability. Uh, and then uh, we'll break down into uh, our normal, you know, a small group of groups. Uh, and then we'll end the evening. So uh, we'll get every, everybody out of here on time. Um, so, Sacramento economy. What is it? What does it mean? Um, I'm going to read you a definition. Uh, the definition is, The church was made manifest to the world on the day of Pentecost by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So as Catholics, we believe that the um, church started um, you know, on the day of Pentecost, right? You know, that's when we believe the birth of the church happened. So you know, when the Holy Spirit was made manifest, um, you know, through uh, the, um, the apostles being, um, you know, uh, all together. You know, if we remember the, the, uh, the, the, the book of Acts where it talks about the earthquake and everybody started to, um, you know, uh, speak in tongues, but they could understand one another, right? So um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, the gifts of the Spirit, again, the Holy Spirit ushers in a new era in the dispensation of the mystery, the age of the church, during which Christ manifests makes present and communicates his work of salvation through the liturgy of his church until he comes. In this age of the, of the church, Christ now lives and acts in and with his church in a new way appropriate to this new age. He acts through the sacraments in what the common tradition of the East and the West calls the sacramental economy. This is the communication or dispensation of the fruits of Christ's Paschal Mystery and Celebration of the Church's Sacramental Liturgy. So basically, um, as Catholics, we believe that uh, everything started with God the Father, right? You know, everything started, um, you know, with, with God creating the world, all right? And so from the be very beginning, he blessed our first parents, right, Adam and Eve, okay? Um, Adam and Eve were given some very special gifts up front which you may or may not be aware of. We call these the preternatural gifts. Um, they were given basically three gifts. One is what we call infused knowledge, or what we would call supernatural knowledge. So when Adam and Eve were created, they were really created as perfect beings, right? In the sense that they had this supernatural knowledge, you know, not which would be different than an ordinary human intellect. Okay? So they were created with that. They were also uh, created with the absence of concupiscence, you know, which basically means they were created, you know, to love God and really not, you know, with that inclination to sin. Okay. Also, they were created to live forever. You know, they were created to, to live immortally. You know, to have bodily immortality is what the church calls it. Excuse me, bodily immortality is what the church calls it. So they were created that way, but they were also created with free will. So as we know, Adam and Eve then, you know, chose through the temptation of, you know, the, the, set, the serpent or the devil, whatever, you know, you want to call them, you know, the, the, the devil, Satan, uh, they fell and then original sin came into the world. Um, so after this happened, um, after Adam and Eve sinned, um, you know, as Catholics we believe in original sin and that's uh, passed on to everybody else, you know, to all other human beings, okay, from that point onward. So, instead of us living in a perfect world, as Adam and Eve were put in the garden, you know, until they actually, you know, sinned and, and, and fell, um, you know, that's not the way it is for us, right? You know, but God continued, though, to bless mankind even after the fall of Adam and Eve. And we can see this. Um, through um, Noah. So God blessed Noah uh, in the beginning after Adam and Eve. And I want to read, read this to you. This is from uh, Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 17. So this is the covenant that the Lord established with Noah. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, 
and upon every bird of the air, upon everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. For your lifeblood, I will surely require a reckoning. Of every beast, I will require it. And of man, of every man's brother, I will require of the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. God made man in his own image, and you be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly on the earth, and multiply in it. Then God has said to Noah and to his sons, Behold, I shall establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, every beast of the earth with you, as many as, out, as, many as came out of the ark. I will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will look upon it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So here we have God establishing this covenant with Noah. And the, and, the, and the sign of that covenant, right, is the rainbow, right? So God said, you know, never again, you know, shall I bring the flood waters upon the earth. And the sign of this covenant is the rainbow that's in the sky. Um, so we see here, even though um, our first parents fell in sin, God continues to pursue us, right, through this first covenant with Noah. We see another covenant with Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 17, the covenant with Abraham is seen, and it's verses 1 through 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of, of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceed, exceedingly fruitful, and I will make my nations of you, and kings shall come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between <coughs> you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. And I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So here we see uh, the covenant that he made with Abraham. He told Abram, he changed Abram's name to Abraham, you know, from father of the nations to the father of the multitudes. So Abram's, uh, Abraham's descendants then were blessed, you know, Abraham, you know, this guy's 99 years old, right? So, you know, his, uh, his descendants are blessed for many, many years, um, you know, and we see this, you know, through the scriptures. So these blessings continue to be outpoured from God uh, to, to the human race. Um, we also see these blessings manifest themselves through more of the Bible, through more of the scriptures. We see the covenant, we see what happened with the birth of uh, Abraham's son Isaac, right, when they went up to the top of Mount Moriah. And uh, Abraham, Abraham took his son with him, and um, basically, uh, you know, the Lord was, was testing Abraham and said, you know, we're going to uh, have a sacrifice when we get to the top of, uh, of the mountain. So uh, Abraham was with him, and uh, his son Isaac said, well, where are we going to find the goat and the ram, or the ram, you know, to sacrifice? And Abraham said, um, you know, don't worry about that. You know, God will provide the sacrifice. As we know from reading the scriptures, you know, the sacrifice was going to be his son Isaac. So when Abraham 
proving you know faithful to the, to the Lord pulled out his knife and was ready to, to kill his son and offer him as a sacrifice the Lord stopped him and said no Abraham you proved your fidelity to me you know you don't need to do that you know um, I'm going to continue to bless you and you've uh, you've proven this uh, you know through your relationship with me um, also uh, we see it in the escape from Egypt under Moses right so here we have Moses um, you know the great leader who who uh, the Lord rose up and his conflict with Pharaoh. So we see all of the different, you know, things that happen there. You know, all of the plagues, right, that happen, um, you know, throughout that. And then we, we finally see uh, Moses uh, take the people out of Egypt. Uh, you know, the, the Exodus, right. So he takes them through um, the uh, the Red Sea. We have the parting of the Red Sea. We see the um, all of the Egyptians being, you know, stopped in the Red Sea and then ultimately drowned. But we see Moses being faithful to the Lord and the Lord being faithful to Moses. We see the, the Ten Commandments, right? You know, the blessings of the Ten Commandments that um, the Lord gave to Moses. We also see the election of King David later, right? So we have um, yeah, King David who was, uh, you know, had, had many brothers and uh, they came to his uh, father Jesse, uh, the, um, the great prophet did, uh, Samuel, to go ahead and to um, raise up a king. Uh, so each one of the brothers came in front of Samuel, and Samuel was like, no, Lord, you know, uh, the Lord was like, no, he's not the one, he's not the one. So he finally went to Jesse and said, do you have any more sons? And he's like, well, yeah, actually, I've got one other son, but he's really young, and he's out um, in the fields with the sheep. He said, well, bring him over. So he brings David in, and then the Lord speaks to Samuel and says, he's the one, anoint him. So we have King David, and then David is you know, one of the greatest kings, right, uh, in, in Israel. So David comes into the picture, and then we see David's falling away from the Lord, right, with his sin with Bathsheba. Okay, so he, he covets Uriah's wife Bathsheba, and he sees her one evening when he's on the rooftop, and he says, I have to have her. So he, he commits adultery with her, and he actually takes Uriah, who was a warrior, and there was a war going on at that time, and he takes Uriah, and he says, all right, Uriah, I'm going to put you in the front of the battle, you know, because you're one of my greatest warriors. He puts him in the front of the battle, and Uriah is killed. So, um, you know, then the prophet uh, Samuel goes to David and says, tells him uh, basically a parable about, um, you know, two landowners and a dispute that happened. And, uh, you know, it turns out that he's basically telling David, he's saying, David, you're that person. So David had to uh, atone for his sins, uh, his sin with Bathsheba. But the Lord continued, though, to be, you know, faithful to us and faithful to his covenants. So we see this all throughout salvation history. There can be a lot more examples that I could bring up. But um, you know, this continues to happen all through the ages. So in the church's liturgy, and this is out of Catechism, paragraph 1082, in the church's liturgy, the divine blessing is fully revealed and communicated. The Father is acknowledged and adored as the source and the end of all the blessings of creation and salvation. In his word, he became incarnate, died, and rose for us. He fills us with his blessings. Through his word, he pours into our hearts the gift that contains all gifts, the Holy Spirit. So the church recognizes that through Jesus' death, <coughs> his passion, and his death, and his resurrection, um, those blessings, you know, from that, that salvation that he gave us is, it, 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 you know, a free gift for us to take is now poured into our hearts. And when Jesus left, he promised that he, the Holy Spirit would be with us, right? He said the, the, the Holy Spirit, would, the, the paraclete, the advocate, would come, and the Holy Spirit is now, you know, with us, and uh, it's, it's helping to guide the church. Um, in paragraph 1084, the Catechism says, seated at the right hand of the Father and pouring out the Holy Spirit on his body, which is the church, Christ now acts through the sacraments he instituted to communicate his grace. The sacraments are perceptible signs, meaning words and actions, accessible to our human nature. By the action of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, they make present efficaciously the, the grace that they signify. So some of you might remember that Baltimore Catechism this is the old catechism of the church before we, we have the, the new catechism that was put together um, you know, pretty recently within like the last uh, things like 20 years. Um, but the Baltimore Catechism defined a sacrament as it's an outward sign, um, an outward, I don't know what it says, 
An outward sign. Instituted, Help me by, out. instituted by Christ to give grace. Thank you. An outward sign uh, instituted by Christ designed to give grace. That's it, exactly. So, and that's that's it in a nutshell. That, that's really what a sacrament means. Um, so, uh, with the sacraments, uh, in paragraph 1088, it says, To accomplish so great a work, the dispensation or communication of his, of his work of salvation, Christ is always present in the church, especially in her liturgical celebrations. So, in the Catholic Church, we believe that the Mass is that really the culmination um, of, our, of our worship. So, the, the Mass is, is really the pinnacle and the highlight of Catholic worship. Right? And, you know, a lot of times you might not think that because you might go to a Mass and be like, oh, man, I'm bored, or I don't understand this, or you know, the priest is boring, or that homily was no good, or this or that. But, you know, as we go through our CIA, we're going to talk more about the Mass, and we're going to talk about the different parts of the Mass, and, you know, what the Mass, you know, really means. But it, it, to, the, to the Church and to Catholics, it's really the, the pinnacle of, of our worship. Um, he, meaning Jesus, is present in the sacrifice of the Mass, not only in the person of the minister, which would be the priest, the same offering now through the ministry of priests who formerly offered himself on the cross, but especially in the Eucharistic species. By his power, he is present in the sacraments, so that when anybody baptizes, it is really Christ himself who baptizes. He is present in the Word, since, he, since it is he himself who speaks when the Holy Scriptures are read in church. So he's not only present in the Eucharist, right, but he's present in, in the scriptures. He's present in the Bible. He's present in what we hear at Mass. Um, and he's present in the, in the sacraments. You know, so it says, you know, the, the Catechism says that who, who, so when anybody baptizes, it's really Christ himself who baptizes. Uh, and lastly, he is present when the church prays and sings, for he has promised when two or three are gathered in my name, uh, there I am in the midst of them. So we, we see, you know, that, that Christ is, is, uh, is present, you know, in the liturgy. Uh, he's also present tonight with us, right? You know, I mean, present all the time, right? But, you know, when two or three are gathered in, in his name, you know, he's going to be in the midst of them. Um, and one, in paragraph uh, 1113, it's, the catechism says, The whole liturgical life of the church revolves around the Eucharistic sacrifice and the sacraments. There are seven sacraments in the church. All right, test time. Uh, what are the seven sacraments? Give them to you. Baptism. Baptism. Marriage. Okay. Reconciliation. Baptism. Matrimony. Anointing of the sick. Anointing of the sick. That's all right. That's good. That's four. Anybody else? Can anybody else think of any others? So we've got baptism. We have the Eucharist, right? You said the Eucharist, didn't you? No, it's the Oh, okay, sorry. I just gave you another one. Uh, so we have anointing of the sick, we have matrimony, we have holy orders. What are we missing? Confirmation. Confirmation. And what else? We got one more. Did you say baptism? You said baptism, right? So we're missing one more. Did you say reconciliation? I did say reconciliation. You did, okay. We got it then. So seven sacraments baptism, confirmation, uh, or what, confirmation is sometimes called chrismation in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church, so you might hear it refer to that. Anointing of the oil. Mm -hmm. yes, That's correct, the yes. <laughs> the anointing of the oil, exactly. Uh, and you'll, you'll, uh, you'll all be confirmed uh, when, when you come in on the Easter uh, vigil. Uh, some of you will be baptized, right? Uh, but, um, you know, everybody will be confirmed and everybody will also take part in, uh, in the Eucharist. So we have baptism, confirmation, or chrismation. We have the Eucharist. We have uh, the sacrament of penance, or what's also called reconciliation, uh, the anointing of the sick, holy orders, and matrimony. Okay, so those are the seven sacraments. Good job, guys. You did, you did really well. Um, so we call baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist uh, sacraments of initiation. Okay, so those are the sacraments that are, and those are the sacraments, again, that you guys will uh, be going through. Baptism, Confirmation, and the Eucharist. So those of you that haven't been baptized before, you will be baptized um, at the Easter Vigil. Uh, you, um, some churches, uh, you know, some Catholic churches, um, actually baptize uh, in a humongous baptism with font and would practice, um, could practice immersion, uh, where you're actually dunked under the water. Um, others, uh, like St. Gertrude's, uh, you're going to uh, have the water poured on you. Okay, so uh, pouring uh, of the water. And then some 
um, uh, Protestant churches actually do um, uh, sprinkling. You know, so you actually sprinkle water on you. So any of those are valid. Uh, valid baptisms, as long as they're done in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, um, so we will give you baptismal gowns at the uh, at the uh, Easter vigil, but your hair will be wet. And I like it when the priest puts a lot of water on it. I don't know. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll do that. So, um, and then everybody will be confirmed. And John, you mentioned a few minutes ago about oil, so everybody will, will receive. Uh, the uh, chris, chris, uh, chris, chrismation oil uh, from uh, on uh, on the Easter vigil, so everybody will be confirmed, and then everybody will receive the Eucharist. So those are called the sacraments of um, excuse me of initiation. Um, we have two sacraments of healing, right, which would be penance or reconciliation and the anointing of the sick. So we have those two. One would be for physical healing, uh, and the other will be for healing of your, of your soul, your spiritual healing. And then lastly, we have the two uh, other sacraments, um, which we call the sacraments at the service of communion, which are holy orders, so the sacraments uh, for, the, for the priesthood, uh, and um, also matrimony, uh, right, for, uh, for those of us that uh, are married or will be getting married. Um, so basically, what that means, sacraments of the service of, uh, of communion, they confer a particular mission in the church and serve to build, build up the people of God, right? So a priest obviously has a mission, you know, to provide the sacraments to, to lead a parish in some cases, um, and, um, you know, their purpose. Um, is it, in, in the documents of Vatican II, I don't know if you've ever looked at the documents of Vatican II or read any of the documents of Vatican II, um, they refer to a pastor as a pastor of souls. So and that's referred to you know, many, many times in the documents. So a uh, pastor is not just a, a clerical position or anything, they're actually a pastor of souls. So uh, that, I like to always remember that when I'm talking to a priest, that that priest is, is a, uh, a pastor of souls. Um, so definitions of, of the sacraments are found in the Catechism, uh, paragraph 1131. It says the sacraments are efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us. The visible rites by which the sacraments are celebrated signify and make present the graces proper to each sacrament. They bear fruit in those who receive them with the required dispositions. So again, the sacraments are not magical, all right? So, you know, they're not magic sacraments that you just, you know, you have to have uh, the right dis disposition for the sacraments. And I'll give you an example, right? So the church says um, that if someone has a moral <laughs> sin upon their soul, they are not to receive the Eucharist. They need to go to confession before they can receive the Eucharist. That's the disposition, right? So if somebody has an improper disposition, they need to get that taken care of before they receive the Eucharist. If someone goes to confession, and in confession, they don't confess all of their sins, or they skip a particular sin for some reason, or withhold a particular sin, or they confess their sins and they're not, they don't have that firm purpose of amendment, they're not sorry for those sins, right? Um, you know, the disposition is not correct. That's not a correct disposition. So in order for us to receive the graces that we uh, can receive from the sacraments, we have to have that proper disposition. So how do we get that? Well, we get that by establishing that personal relationship with Christ and living our life in the, in, in the way according to what Christ, how Christ wants us to live. Does that make sense? So, you know, we, we need to make sure that, you know, if we have any serious sins on our soul, that we go to confession and we get those sins taken care of. We have to do that, you know, we have to seek that forgiveness, you know, and we got to make sure that we cultivate, you know, that relationship with Christ. We have to, you know, spend time, you know, like we talked about in our small group last time with a, a couple, or, or engaged, or, or a married couple, or whatever. I mean, you have to spend time with that person, you know, in order to get to know that person, right? You know, that's what you have to do with, with Jesus. I mean, you can't just, like, go to Mass once a week and go, yeah, i got a great relationship with Christ, I'm telling you. You know, no, I mean, you have to have prayer. You have to, you know, go ahead and, and read the scriptures. You have to get to know him. You know, you need that personal relationship. So, 
the church gives us all of all of the guidelines, right? But it's up to us. <laughs> well, you know, the church can't do it for you. You know, you need to accept that grace. And the sacraments are a great way to get that grace, you know, from uh, uh, from the Lord. Okay. So um, we believe as Catholics that um, again they're efficacious signs, meaning that they're effective. Okay. So that when we go to confession as a Catholic, we know that we are forgiven of our sins. We know that Christ has forgiven those sins through the priest. Okay? We know that. So we know we have that, that forgiveness. Uh, we know when we receive the Eucharist that we're receiving the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. We know that. When, you, when you're baptized, okay, any sins that you've committed up until that point of baptism, they're all forgiven. Okay? So you guys that are baptized for the first time, you don't have to go to confession, you know, because baptism is going to wipe away all of those sins that you've committed in your past. Now, when you walk out the church doors, I would say you're probably going to sin again at some point, right? So you will have that sacrament of confession at some point. But that's what baptism does. So we know that, you know, through the proper means of baptism, that those sins, you know, are, are forgiven. Okay? Um, and so forth. So, with confirmation as an example, when, when we're confirmed, right? You know, when most, most Catholics, I would say 95% probably, are baptized as infants. So they're baptized as babies, they don't remember their baptism, that's how it was for me. You know, but their parents are standing up and saying, you know, hey, you know, we are going to raise our child or children in the faith. And then, you know, later, they're going to have to make an adult decision whether or not they're going to continue on in the faith and whether or not they're going to pursue a relationship with Christ. Well, that's what happens in the Catholic Church when you're confirmed. You know, you stand up, you know, and you say, you know, I am, you know, going to, and I can't remember the word of confirmation anymore, but whatever those are, you know, you're standing up in front of the assembly and you're saying, you know, I, you know, am going to go forward with the faith. You know, I believe in what the church teaches and I'm going to go ahead and, um, you know, bring that into my life. All right? So, um, and then in holy matrimony, right? So when, when we're married, I mean, we're standing up there with our spouse, and, uh, you know, once we're married, and the goal of a married couple, you know, the goal of a husband and wife should be to get that spouse to heaven. That should be the primary goal of the relationship. Get your spouse to heaven. Get your kids to heaven, right? I mean, that's what you should be doing. Um, also, um, uh, the uh, of course you know holy orders that's a special grace that people are given uh, you know in the priesthood you know the ministerial priesthood that's a, that's a special gift that Father Jerome has and that Father Ezra has and Father Andre Joseph all the priests up here all, all priests all you know everywhere uh, and then um, and then what we call uh, uh, anointing of the sick that's another one uh, that the, the the priest only the priest can go ahead and administer anointing of the sick, okay? So the Catholic Church has healing services. That's different than anointing of the sick. The anointing of the sick is a, is a sacrament, so, you know, where, you know, a priest comes in and anoints a person. It doesn't have to be if someone's dying, you know. It, it can be for a person that is facing surgery, right? It's going to be put under, you know. Uh, it can be for a person that has cancer or a person that's in the hospital for this reason or that reason. But it has to be something, you know, serious. It's not going to be for somebody who has a cold, okay, or something like that. But, you know, it's got to be for, uh, for something pretty serious. Okay, so, um, and this is how, this is how serious um, that, uh, that we, and we believe that Christ instituted the sacraments. And this is from the Council of Trent, which happened way back when, in 1545. It was a council that lasted from 1545 to 1563. And in one of the canons in the Council of Trent, it says, If anyone shall say that the sacraments of the new law were not all instituted by Jesus Christ our Lord, or that they are more or less than seven, to wit, baptism, confirmation of the Eucharist, they go on to name all of them, uh, or even that any one of these seven is not truly and properly a sacrament, let him be anathema. All right? What does anathema mean? Let him be thrown out of the church. <laughs> so, you know, who wouldn't say that today? But, you know, but the point is, is that the church seriously, you know, uh, recognizes the sacraments. And we also believe, you know, that the sacraments are necessary for salvation. In the sense that Christ set up the church, Christ gave us the sacraments, and the sacraments are ways, you know, that we can grow closer to Christ. 
the church teaches that the sacraments are necessary for, or for salvation. Um, and we also believe that sacraments transmit divine life, meaning that 